Hey everyone, it's Red. This week's episode comes with a disclaimer. This is the disclaimer. The episode acknowledges the existence of sex, gay sex specifically, and the adult entertainment industry. If you listen with your kids and you don't want them hearing about those topics at this time, you can skip the podcast for now and come back to it later. That said, this episode features an interview with Colby Keller, uh, who came to Wisconsin to join us in our recording studio. Our discussion is a bit meandering, but focuses on his work in the entertainment industry for adults. Uh, the recent Supreme Court decision, which legalized gay marriage, and the nature of marriage in general in our society. This episode also is just the first part of our discussion with Colby, so I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Marxism Today. I am Red Wagner. I am Tony Schmidt. And today we are joined by a Mr. Colby Keller. <laughs> this is a really exciting episode. I th Colby, can we just start with you telling our audience a little bit about yourself? Let's see. I'm a porn performer and I'm an artist. And right now I'm working on a project where I'm traveling the United States with the idea that I make a video in every state. Yeah, tell us the name of your project. I love the name. It's called Colby Does America. I, I originally wanted it to be Colby F***s America. Oh, can I say that? I don't think any kids listen to our show, but we should. Oh, uh, Just I can, in case. We can beep it out. Yeah, Colby F-Words America, which I couldn't actually do because I had to, uh, to raise money for the project. I had used a crowd um, funding site. Oh, okay. And um, you can't have like the F-Word on there. Oh, um, and I wanted a nice homage to Debbie Does Dallas. Right. Um, so that's the the origin of the the project name. You can't use swear words on it. No, you couldn't. And yeah, like, it's kind of surprising. Huh. And actually, in Kickstarter, won't even do a project that involves adult adult oriented content. Really? Yeah. Oh, so that's so we couldn't why you do ended up on the platform that you're on. Yeah, exactly. Indiegogo is that what Indiegogo? You used? Yeah. Okay. Weird. I've never tried to crowdfund anything, obviously, but. When you're in my line of work, you'll find that, like, the world is very anti-sex and very, like, skittish about anything that involves sex. Like, I've had my Instagram account deleted three times, I think, for things that weren't even very... Once, actually, I, I did a project where I gave everything I owned away. Yeah, tell, yeah, yeah. tell the audience the name of that project. Uh, that project was called Everything But Lenin. So I gave everything away except for this bust of um, Lenin that I actually bought off of eBay from the Ukraine. I think someone like tore it off of a building. It's really sad, but I oh. bought it. <laughs> and I got a really good deal on it, actually. And um, I actually eventually decided to kind of leave that in this cave in Tennessee where I finished the project. Um, and I gave everything away to free for free. So anyone would come into my apartment and say, hey, I want your drum kit, and I would just give it to them. Yeah, and then I, one thing I gave away was my Instagram account. And uh, <laughs> this young artist who uh, goes to the school that I went to decided to take it. And um, she is a she, and she's also African-American. And there were a lot of people on Instagram that did not like that. And she would just post pictures of herself, like, you know, just in her apartment. Nothing, nothing bad about it at all, and they instantly deleted the account. Wait, people that were okay with your Instagram account before this had happened? We're not happy when... I, and I think the reason the account got deleted is because there were user-generated complaints. Oh, it isn't like, uh, well, you are no longer who registered this that, account. That's what they claim, is identified. that I had like violated their terms. But I'm like, how can you say... Like, I did agree to give this to her. Like, you can't claim it's not me. Yeah, can't you... You know, who are you to claim what I am as an entity? Right. Isn't yeah. that also, too, if you did part of an art project, isn't, like, the idea of somebody else taking it over and doing it not, like, that... Why is that different from the... continue? It's like a continuation of the project. So if the Instagram is meant to be, like, you know, it's meant to be more of an artsy thing. Like, why is that, you know? Well, I, mean? I think it's meant to be something else, which is 
like a lot of social media platforms like directed to, you know, uh, they want to trace behavior of the people that use it and they want yeah, people to use it in a cer in certain way, you know. You're corrupting the integrity of their data because right. they have you pegged with all these demographics and right. and oh. all of that. And if you start right. messing with uh, putting two people on one account, then how are they going to you know, create the profile of you to more effectively, like, use targeting marketing against you and all that. Yeah. You subverted their advertising. And they, and they really want this idea that, like, every person is, like, uh, a brand. Every person can be their own brand, right? Mm, so, I like, just, that's the kind of ideology it encourages in its users. And I was subverting that. And, of course, they didn't want that. So. And I just oh. recently installed that on my phone. Finally, and now you make me want to. I should just go delete it. Now. I mean, I enjoyed using it. and It was fun to play with it, but like, I got to. I got deleted two more times. The second time was interesting. They deleted me, and I did have a picture like where I was in a hot tub, and you could kind of see my butt. So like, maybe that oh, was the reason why. You can't do nudity on Instagram. Uh, a lot of people do, and like I've seen accounts where they just show like you know. But um, they don't seem to shut those ones down, but they shut mine down. Too high profile for them? I think so. Or you've already and, gotten and pro the go. It probably was like users complaining. Hmm. And there's no recourse. There's like no one you can go to. You can't email anyone. You can't. There's nothing. Like it's total dead end. And, um, and technically the account's been suspended. So I went to open a new account. Uh -huh. And... Um, Probably within that same day, they sent me a message saying, can you please verify the account using your phone number, which I did. And they said, oh, your account is approved or been verified. And then um, the next time I logged in, it was shut down. They deleted the account because <laughs> I think my other account had used the same phone number. Yeah. Man. So, so they knew who you were. They, they knew, knew who I was, and they're like, you will not account. have another Instagram account. <laughs> we are stopping this. That's so I do have someone, actually. So part of my project, Colby Does America, is I really want to collaborate with as many people as possible. And there was a woman, um, good working class woman in Kentucky, who started on her own initiative, started her own Instagram account for me oh, and for cool. the project. And um, so there is a Colby Does America Instagram that's run by people who are – who are helping the project. I was going to say, I mean, especially if their main concern is like profit. I mean, I assume you come with a decent amount of followers on something like that. So it would be a somewhat disadvantageous of them to not have you on there. I don't or know. Or do they not think... care enough unless you're getting like a hundred million billion people? I don't like, it's hard to say if it was, if there's someone at Instagram, like I know the, I think the owner of Instagram is actually a gay man. Um, so there, it's very likely he knows who I am you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he might not like me, you know, huh? and that might be part of what's behind it. I don't know. So, uh, for preparation for this session, uh, I did check out some of your project already because you have some of the videos up already. You're doing one video in every state, right? Trying to, yeah. Yep. Uh, and I was surprised. They were very artsy. I mean, this is not just like you rolling around and like videotaping sex in the back of a van or in some hotel room. Like, this is... This is something that I don't think would stand out very badly in, like, a contemporary art museum. Like, you probably wouldn't have a lot of pieces like these. Right. Because <laughs> that, that might be a little bit too much male sex, ma male gay sex or whatever. Uh, I did film yeah. one straight scene that I'm very proud of. Oh, that has for not, real. has not come out yet. Yeah. <laughs> but... The you've got sets, you've got costumes. Sometimes you've got overlaid music and and audio clips. The they come off as very artistic mashups, really. Um, at least the the few that I that I looked at. Well, the way that I think about the project is, I mean, uh, I had a bit of a crisis moment uh, with my art practice, largely because I also. Uh, perform a type of labor that is a lot of people don't think too highly of, yeah. <laughs> which is sex work. Uh -huh. And as an artist, I felt a responsibility to address that, the, the type of labor that I was performing. Um, and so I wanted to do that with this project and do it, you know, pretty aggressively and head on. So to be explicit with what it is that I have to do. Um, but I kind of see 
sex and even like the videos themselves, almost like the MacGuffin, you know, it's the thing that it seems like the project is about that, but ultimately it's about something else. And uh, the something else is um, collaboration. Mm. Um, so I work with a lot of people, a lot of people I don't know and haven't met. Uh, you know, this wonderful uh, volunteer in the UK, this woman who stepped forward with her partner who lives in Mexico, and they they offered to build out the website for free and design it. And I actually send her hard drives with all of the content that I've shot, and she distributes it to editors who I've never met. So those people are responsible for taking the footage and making something with it that that they can claim for themselves and you know be creative with or maybe not be creative with. You can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> and um so ultimately like that's the thing I'm interested in is that kind of relationship mm-hmm. and and also trying to find a way to to take a a, a public persona which is what I have is Colby Keller Mm -hmm. and to invite other people to participate in the construction of that persona to collectivize the persona. Yeah. You're socializing it. You're (laughs) yeah, exactly. (laughs) Nice. You're subverting the capitalism (laughs) of it. Try trying to like at least play with it. Yeah. Yeah. And because you brought up the, your productive relationships as you go through this project, I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit about that. I, I had read an interview that, um, you had had an offer for a sponsor for the project, or um, I did, a yeah, worked with before. I did. It's a company I've worked with before. They've actually been like very good to me as a company. Mm-hmm. Um, they've given me a lot of work. They don't necessarily pay very well, but you know they give me work um, and pretty consistently. And a, a couple of different people approached me about funding the project and basically taking it over. And um, they approached me and they offered me quite a bit of money. It was about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which is a lot, you know. Um, and honestly, like, given what I have to work with now, like, it's still not a ton of money to like accomplish what it is that I'm doing. Well, yeah, because this is actually a really big project. Because uh, I think it's publicly known the, your, the amount that you raised on Indie, which was I think it was like forty some forty three thousand, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which I was surprised to learn that that you were being able to attempt this project with with that amount of funding because I've mean, already run out of that oh, <laughs> like okay. a long time ago. Yeah, with travel <laughs> expenses and just everything. I, oh yeah, it's I mean, crazy. It's an expensive project, I presume. Yeah, really expensive. And like you know, I had done this other project where I gave everything away, so I literally didn't have shoes. So like, the part a big chunk of that money was to just buy like shoes and underwear and a computer and cameras, like stuff that I would need to get to the point where I can even get on the road. Sure. Um, and so I've had to rely a lot on um, other kinds of donations that have come in like people who've offered their house or like food um i've had to borrow friends cars um which has really come in handy um and also people have continued to donate to the project which has really helped oh nice they can still do that even though it's closed or yeah i did um you can continue to donate and i also did a piece not i wouldn't say it was a joke but um where i decided to take certain belongings that I had with me and have used on the trip and to sell them, but to sell them as art pieces. Uh-huh. Um, so like sell my t-shirt for like $2,000, you know, and obviously like the money is to help fund the project. Sure. Um, but also like kind of a critique on um, the relationship between value and objects in the art world. And, and like an homage to like my fellow sex workers who sell themselves, you know, to, for, to generate income. And, um, so I call it a horse store and I did 50 objects for the 50 States uh-huh. and, and also one other object, which was a t-shirt. So I always thought that like in the t-shirt was 15 bucks. So it was like the cheapest thing on, in the store. <laughs> the idea being that like, if you go to the store, there's like all these objects, but they're like out of uh, like your, your normal price range. And so uh-huh. like, there'd be the one thing, which is the t-shirt, which you could buy. Um, but I actually have had several people buy things from the store. Um, and I just recently had a very generous donation come in, um, which has kind of helped me through the summer. Um, but yeah, this company offered me a lot of money, but like they, what they wanted to do is make it, you know, a porn project. They were going to send in porn models to every state, pay the porn models. 
they would have even, I think, given me a camera, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So it was a really sweet deal, but I would have been making very traditional porn videos that they would then put on their site and charge viewers. Would they have been themed, like, for every state? Like, Texas, there's a cowboy hat. In Wisconsin, there's cows in the back. Or like I was, like, it was a really <laughs> sweet deal. I was, like, you can do whatever you want. Just, like, make, like, an amateur porn video. We're going to put it on our website. They wanted to use it as a way to... um generate traffic to a new site that they bought and were repurposing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they, that they really wanted to focus on amateur sex. So this was going to be like kind of the vehicle to, to advertise for that. Could they do that? I mean, it wouldn't really be amateur sex if it's you and a bunch of other, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) They wanted to make it look amateur. It's like, like astroturfing, like a fake grassroots uh, group. It's like, this is, fake uh amateur uh and they gave me originally they gave me a deal i really liked which was a lot less money but um oh and then the final deal was that they would own the videos in perpetuity yeah yeah now we get down to the ownership of the means of production well the first deal though is like we'll match whatever you raise we'll match whatever you raise and you only have to give us every other video and we'll only own it for a year and then it's yours Oh, yeah. and I'm like, that's a good deal. I like that. Like, uh-huh. I can totally work with that. And then they realized that. And then like, they realized, oh, no. <laughs> oh, maybe we should get better terms. And I think they thought that like more money would just, you know, that I would be like a normal human being and he and, and like hear that amount and just like instantly agree to do it. And it's hard to say. Like, I don't know if that was a generous deal or not. Like, I don't know what kind of income they bring in. Um. Because that, uh, that money would be the expense budget for the whole project. Like, that's right. not your salary. That's what you got to spend for everything right. to get this thing done. No, I mean, I think I could have taken some of that as, like, well, income, yeah. Yeah, but only the amount left at the end, right? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they would have only paid me for every video that I completed. Hmm. So it would have been for every video that I completed up to the maximum, which would be 50. Okay, like pro-rated, basically. Yeah, exactly. And they, they would give me some Canada? of it up front. Uh, I don't think, well, 100, yeah, I don't think they would have. I don't remember how it worked out. But the, the the thing that really, like, stuck with me, though, is they wanted to charge people to see the videos. Mm. And this is after I had just raised a lot of money from people who, like, you know, gave me their hard-earned, like, income, you know, like, $5 at a time to support the project. Like, the last thing I want to do is, like, turn around and charge those people to see the the content. Uh-huh. And I just couldn't, at the end of the day, do that. And uh, honestly, it wouldn't be an art project anymore. It wouldn't be addressing the issues I wanted to, to address. It would just, I would just be working a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't, you know, compelled to do that, I think. I, I think the one of the things that's most interesting for me and, and maybe for our listeners as well is the the fact that you were presented with, like, this good deal we'll say the 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 good deal which put you in a position of the worker of you know you did not own necessarily the videos you didn't right. you were, weren't being able to make the call on that and and what you chose to do is uh something different where you had control but i love the fact that you mentioned earlier that you want it to be a collaborative project and the, and that yeah. you work collaboratively with collaboratively with so many people so uh, the example of that was that you gave the the raw footage to an editor who then has the executive power to choose how to put it together in the end. Yeah. And, and I think that's really interesting because that's not, you know, that you can almost lay it out as three different choices, right? There's one where you're an employee to a capitalist. There's one where you do everything alone, like a self-employed model. And then there's the collaborative cooperative dare i say communist model and and uh you've chosen the third yeah and it's really like i could not be happier with with the results like i'm continuing to learn things and it's difficult it's very difficult work you know but like i i really feel like i'm um getting to the place that i wanted to get at and it's hard too. like we're you know relinquishing control over something is a very difficult process and there have been some videos i've gotten back that like as an artist like aren't my aesthetic and it's hard for me to like 
you know, like, well, this is my project. That's my video. You know, like, <laughs> like, you know, it's really hard to like, to, to, to release and to let that happen. Uh-huh. Um, but I think it's necessary for what I want to do with the project. And, and I think that's an important lesson just as a, a human being. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy with the way it's going. And had I taken that deal, like, man, I wouldn't, or even if I was like, you know, some authoritarian artist like trying to control every aspect of the project, a, I wouldn't be able to do it. Like I just could not complete this on my own. Um, and B, like, I don't know how satisfying that would be at the end of the day, ultimately, hmm. or what I would really learn. Like I would just learn more about myself maybe. Let me ask you, and maybe you don't want to give away teasers, but what's the Wisconsin video going to be? I don't know yet. I don't know yet. <laughs> I have to find a Wisconsin model actually first. <laughs> Um, oh, man. the part of the problem with the project is like, I can't really, I tried a, a, at the beginning of it to put calls out to find people in different States and I will film anyone. Like I will, you know, I will film anyone. I will only have sex with some types of people cause I do have a sexuality that functions mm-hmm. in a particular way. <laughs> um, and I think that's fair and I should be allowed that. Um, yeah. But I will film anyone, and um, but finding people who are willing and comfortable to be on camera and explore what that means, it's hard. Yeah. I get stood up a lot. I get a lot of catfish. And what, I discovered catfish? someone who has like a fake profile online. Oh. And um, yeah, they put up fake pictures. And... Well, so, what's the point of people making a f- fake profile and contacting you, though? Why, why would anyone do that? Because they want to, they want to be able to engage me and talk about it. And at the end, and there are some people who are like also malicious. There's a lot of people oh, like for that. Real? Oh yeah, and there are people who also have fake profiles of me. I think there's actually a ring of like Russian scam artists who are trying. And they'll they have a profile. They talk to people about the project, and and then you eventually get an email where they're trying to extract your credit card info. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another like, person. I needed the cash advance in order to come to your state yeah. or whatever. I didn't even think about that. I'm glad you didn't ask for it. <laughs> like, there's another person who I think is an artist because I think this person actually emailed me. And um, I'm pretty sure they have a fake profile of me and they try to figure out the city I'm going to next. And in effect, kind of sabotage me in that place. Yeah, and it's, I don't know who this person is or why they're doing that, but I think that's also been an issue. So there are moments on this trip where I get really paranoid because it's like, I don't know. People do crazy things and you never know like who you're talking to or what what's going to happen. So you just blew my mind there. But. You, know, you know what? The, yeah. the, the, this might be a good time because what you've just mentioned reminds me of the recent uh, Supreme Court decision to legalize gay marriage nationally. It, what, what you were saying reminded me of the backlash of that, but that was something that we wanted to ask you about just to see your take on it. Uh, about gay marriage or like what's... And, and the recent Supreme, Co- Supreme Court decision. Um, I'm not a huge... I'm not a, I'm not a marriage supporter <laughs> uh, uh, right. in general. Uh-huh. I mean, I do as a as someone like I would identify myself actually as a communist. I believe in. Uh, well, I mean, there was a period in my life where I actually had two partners, and we weren't. It wasn't like we were in a throuple. Like I was, kind of, was I was more like a polygamist, and. Um, what I realized in that, and which was really instructive, is that it is possible to love multiple people mm. and to love them equally, or maybe live, love them very differently, but to, to love them both. And that um, it's important to be able to recognize that as a truth. And marriage, which is kind of limited to uh, a legal arrangement between two people, I think sure, is yeah. just not fair to that idea. Um, so my position has always been like, I'll support gay marriage when like, you know, a polyamory or polygamous marriage is legal too. And I think that honestly, like being a gay man, most gay men have, you know, even when they're in relationships, most of the time they're open. Like it's very common for people to have, you know, multiple partners of some, some sort. 
And I just don't think that gay marriage is honest to that reality that most gay men live. And I think mm. in some ways it's destructive because it will pe put people in relationships where, you know, it's conservative. Like it makes you conservative. It's about property. It's not about like love. And to confuse those two things, I think, can be be hurtful. And yeah, I think you can say that's more. That's about straight marriage. Oh, true. Yeah, like, no, there's of plenty. Like yeah, yeah. I, mean, I yeah. I wonder if it's. Uh, uh, gay re relationships that maybe there's just a little bit more openness about the open whereas the traditional heterosexual is no this is only you know where it's always cheating it's not really well, if you it doesn't tend to be open I guess. right yeah I mean, if you think about it in terms of, like, the trajectory of U.S. history and revolutionary moments, right, there were, like, hey, there's, like, the, the, the women's movement and there's uh, the, the sex kind of uh, movement that happens in the 60s and 70s. And the gay, gay liberation movement is part of that. And, like, the kernel of the gay liberation movement was not just to, like, liberate gay people, right? To make us be able to live in a world where we can, like, be open. Mm -hmm. But to liberate straight people, too. Like, that you can embrace your sexuality and, like, it's what it means. And, and that it doesn't have to be, for instance, a negative thing to love more than one person. And that can be, that can be, that should be a normal thing. And that, like, power, that kind of revolutionary potential that, like we as gay people once had, like I think has been stripped away and gay marriage has helped strip that away. Mm, and yeah. I think it's like important to get people rights and make people feel a part of society. And there are definitely people who want that kind of relationship for themselves and should have it. And yeah. I don't, I don't begrudge them that. And ultimately I think, I don't know. I'm conflicted about it because I think it's a conservative institution that creates really conservative, limited types of relationships that ultimately probably aren't the healthiest thing for most human beings, particularly because they're all about property. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, of course, like I want equal rights and I think gay people should be recognized as equals. Yeah. So it's like a difficult position to be in politically because like I don't really believe in the institution, but, and I am actually married. So, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you ever read the Jacobin, um, but they had an article, I don't know, a while ago called Waiting for SCOTUS that was talking about mm -hmm. the the left, er, I guess not necessarily the left, but liberal stuff, like basically switching from trying to uh, get movements on the ground to, well, let's push this in the courts. Let's get this to the Supreme Court, which mm -hmm. is, you know, how uh, gay marriage has ultimately been legalized the country what do you think about like that sort of react that sort of shift from people politics to sort of you know the very undemocratic uh supreme court i did not support it you know like there were and it was like a couple of very rich gay couples who were pushing the issue particularly at a moment like that was it first started happening during the the election the what was it the i think the first George Bush, W. Bush election. Hmm. And they used it as um, a strategy to, to like get enough conservative voters to put him in power. And it was a very deliberate strategy on the part of the Republicans to use gay marriage as a wedge issue. And I did not appreciate the fact that there were wealthy, like elite gay people trying to push it in the courts, like aggravating this issue when it shouldn't have been like put there. And honestly, it wasn't necessary because a lot of like legislatures in the country have supported, you know, passed, you know, uh, gay marriage bills. But in terms of like people politics and something that might be a little more strategic, like uh, forcing something through the courts, maybe if we want to put it that way, um, I think using both of those strategies at the same time is also smart. Like you should use every strategy at your hand, like including ones that are maybe a little bit like underhanded, <laughs> not to say that's an underhanded strategy. I think it's a purely, it's a legitimate strategy, particularly within the legal frame that we work within. But, um, we should use every strategy and not limit ourselves to, to certain strategies. Even though some States are resisting it, I f still feel like the Supreme court was sort of like, pretty late to the party on this one. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, 
because, as you mentioned, it was during the Bush years, it was a wedge issue for Democrats. It was a way to split Democrats, and, you know, the, no Democrat knew what to say because you were going to make mad half of the people that voted for Democrats, no matter if you supported it or hated it. Right. And now it's the opposite way for Republicans, and which means the, the sea change has happened. People have basically accepted it, and only at that point do you get the Supreme Court a- approving it. Well, and you also have to remember, too, that, like, the court was kind of in a crisis. Like, there were a lot of people talking about, like, term limits, you know, which is something that should be talked about. But, like, the court wanted to protect its own interest and to protect, you know, the prestige of the court. So you can do that with something like gay marriage, which has enough popular support now, where it looks like they're these champions of human rights. (laughs) Oh, it's so beautiful. America, America, it's so beautiful. And yet they can, like, pass other things like, you know... You know, corporations can vote like people, you know? Yeah, right. (laughs) So it's a good way of, like, covering, like, all of their bad behavior. Another thing I'd like to come back to is when you were, uh, a moment ago, you were talking about how uh, gay marriage wasn't an important fight for you because of that was sort of a way that it was uh, brought within the system and made from something that was revolutionary and really challenged many facets of of uh, the the entire society, you know, challenged, you know, what what love means and and what what relationships are, and you know, was really part of a larger challenge to society. Has now instead been kind of co-opted and brought within the larger system. That reminds me of things that, that I think that's the standard game that happens all the time with radical challenges to capitalism. That's mm-hmm. almost one of the wonderful or or amazing aspects of capitalism frustrating for us leftists but amazing that it can do it all the time is it can always take any major challenge to it and co-opt it you know that's that's why you can you know uh buy like a a a a hemp belt at a hippie themed store in the mall now right what was a major challenge to capitalism has been co-opted same thing with punk rock music same thing with rap music same thing with just challenge after challenge after challenge yeah to the capitalist system so you're saying that the next thing that the supreme court says is going to be like what they said with the the civil rights movement where, well, with everything's equal now, we have a black president, it's good. You think that the next uh, gay rights issue comes up and go, no, 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 we have gay marriage, we've solved the gay rights thing. You think that's <laughs> going to be the popular view? Because I could see that happening. Oh, yeah. Uh, like it, like if the next step, for example, is to say uh, you can't fire someone just because they're gay, yeah. that people are the, the, the argument from the right will be, we don't need to have that because we already legalize gay marriage sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, that it sort of undermines the whole movement. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if that'll be effective. Well, I think in just, like, the in terms of how people live their lives, like, gay marriage can be a good thing. Like, I'm gay married, you know. I married my partner. I used to have domestic partner benefits. And gay marriage became legal in New York State where my partner lives. And in New Jersey and in Connecticut, all the states surround New York. And the company decided um, because gay marriage was legal in all of the states where you could potentially live and commute to to work, um, since it's now legal, they're going to dissolve their domestic partnership policy. Oh. Which I feel is like an actually a much better policy than marriage. And so all (laughs) of a sudden, like instantaneously, I had no medical coverage. Oh. So we had to wow. get married, and we were forced. They're like, you have to get married. Not just get married. They made us get a joint bank account. That we had to show like financial entanglement in order for me to continue to be to get to get insurance from this company. After they, they require that for straight people, I mean, there are straight people that are married. With I don't know. Bank I really don't know. I don't know if what the policy was for for other couples. That's crazy. That is mind boggling. Jesus, is that so, legal like, for them to do? God, is it legal? <laughs> I think you can do pretty much anything if you're a big enough company. Uh, geez. <laughs> I mean, I used to work two jobs in Texas. This is part of the reason I started doing porn. And um, I worked like 70-hour weeks at this one company, Neiman Marcus, big company. I, was, uh, I did their windows. And I would do that during the day. And at night, I worked as a news cameraman. So what was that movie that came out? 
Nightwalker or something. I was that guy. I so, haven't seen that. I've heard of it. I haven't either. I've heard it's good. I haven't seen it. But um, So I used to do both of those jobs at the same time so I wouldn't sleep. And neither job would give me benefits. And even though I worked 70-hour weeks for two years, they called me a temporary worker. Oh, they got my and, Which meant they could fire me at any moment. They could just yeah. say to me, hey, we don't need you for two weeks. Sorry if you're going to starve to death. <laughs> like, and come back in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. And they would do that. And, and that just gave them a, a way to get around paying me health care. And totally legal. Yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunately a model I've seen pop up a lot. I mean, it's really a smart model because you keep the worker, like, really indebted to you as an employer. Like, they're going to always be on good behavior, you know, and you keep them separated enough from, like, that core staff where, like, there's not going to be any solidarity among the workers. Talking with a guy who's a professor, I think, at Temple University, and he said there it's 50% part-time adjuncts and uh, 50% full-time. And, like, CUNY, I know, in New York is 80% uh, adjunct professors, and it's just... Mm -hmm. I've been staying in uh, Oregon for a few, a few weeks, and in Eugene, which is where the University of Oregon is, and um, the newspaper there recently had a story. That I think it was something like I want. Maybe I'm getting this wrong, but I think it was like 60% of the the adjunct staff or the staff at the University of Oregon, like teachers, were on food stamps. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> like they're on welfare. Like the school actually cannot give them a living wage. Jeez. That's awful. Yeah, schools seem to be pretty bad at the. Uh, I work in a business building on campus, and I was recently told by my boss that apparently in the building there are two lounges, a staff lounge, and a faculty lounge. Because <laughs> they don't want the people who clean the floors yeah. and like make the building functionable yeah. interacting with the people with PhDs. Uh, just, like, they're right next to each other, too. It's yeah. just absolutely mind-boggling how they do things in academia. And these are public schools, too. That's it's awful. It's insane. One thing I wanted to come back to, uh, you talked about uh, marriage and your relationship with it, the fact that you're married. It made me think of a term coined, I think Dan Savage made it, monogamish. Uh, okay. I don't know I've if heard, you have I think thoughts I've heard on, this word, on yeah. the idea of mon monogamish or uh, what your take on that is. Well, my take is I am definitely not monogamish. So. It's like because it's, it's like a as spectrum, far right? from that as you can get. <laughs> um, I but I've been in relationships, so I I was in two relationships, and one of them was actually really emotionally abusive, and it took me a long time to kind of. And the mental illness, I think, was also a component in the relationship, and it took me a long time to figure out what was going on and to fully appreciate like how it was not good for me um and part of that dynamic definitely was uh an instinct and a drive that he had to uh it really felt like own me sexually mm -hmm. and to own me in terms of the relationship and it wasn't really about love which like should respect the person for who they are and like you know, maybe you grow into that person. You don't necessarily like try to own them. And, um, and when the relationship ended, like, you know, I was very willing to continue to be friends or whatever he needed to help him and nurture him as a human being, because I continue to love him. And I understand maybe he needs to go in a different place and I can accept that. But like, you know, I don't give up on people. And, um, and what I got back was like really abusive and negative and destructive. And it made me realize that really what was important to him was ownership. Hmm. And that's not love. And a lot of people conceive of love as being about like ownership. Yep. And a lot of it's about sexual ownership. And I think that's a really destructive idea. And, um, it doesn't help people. That's for sure. So like, monogamy i think it's it's fun and it can be really beautiful to be with someone and to to only be with them and to explore what your sexuality is together but like you should allow for like the ability to move outside of that or beyond it if you need to if one of you needs to and to talk openly about it and not let that destroy the like core integrity of your love for each other 
And more often than not, that happens. And I think that happens because people have really bad ideas about property. Hmm. I mean, as like a communist, that's what I was, I would, I, that's how I think of it. Yeah. I don't think it's healthy. So like monogamish, I mean, I, I ha- you know, yeah. I don't know exactly what his definition is. I've heard the term. I, I know he uses it. I think it's like basically an open relationship. I've met his partner actually. Oh, cool. um, and I know that they have, you know, they have sex with other people outside of the relationship. I think. I mean, I, sh- I shouldn't. Po- <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know. <laughs> I can't. Spe- I really don't know. But um, I mean, you know, if it works for people and you're open and you're talking about it, I think whatever term you need, that's okay. Um, as long as like there's a mutual understanding that like whatever that kind of fundamental love is between the two of you, it's not one that's structured around some notion of like ownership and property because you don't own other human beings you <laughs> none of us do and you yeah, right. really can't like you know and you shouldn't and that includes like you know everything from like slavery to like the way we treat people that work for us and with us and yeah. people we love you know yeah it reminds me a little bit of like when you talk about like different, it, even within the institution of marriage, the different styles of marriages that you can have, like the, yeah. the traditional 1950s, like, uh, you know, or, or you can go back further and be, just becomes more extreme where the man owns the woman to a, to a stronger or lesser degree. Right. Uh, it makes sense that the major challenge to that could come from the gay community because that throws the the gender role the aspect of it kind of under the bus a little bit yeah and i mean not i mean having been in that that relationship where i had two partners like i can tell you it was really difficult and challenging and i honestly like didn't have the skills or the knowledge to make it work like it's much more challenging than being in a monogamous relationship partly because Mm -hmm. like we have rules for those like there there's you're everyone socially you understand it like one of the hardest things to negotiate was just, you know, people, the way other people think of you, you know, mm. which I think was hard for the one who ended up being really abusive was like, he couldn't, he was really embarrassed to even acknowledge he was in this relationship. And, you know, like social pressure can also do that. Like it can be really bad. Um, mm-hmm. So we like, we don't have the skills or the, I mean, I'm not saying that those kind of relationships are for everyone either. In my experience, like it was good to go through periods of monogamy Mm -hmm. and those could strengthen a relationship, but they weren't necessary for the relationship to have integrity. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.